Good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, it's very early here in California, so thank you for joining us. I think we have um, well over 220 participants uh, coming in from 38 different countries. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, welcome to the ICRS NextGen webinar on cartilage repair, where we're going to be discussing what's new on the horizon. My name is Cassandra Lee. I'm an associate professor and chief of the sports service here at UC Davis Health in Sacramento, California. My co-moderator is Jorge Chala, an assistant professor and director of the biomechanics lab um, at Rush Medical College and physician at Midwest Orthopedics in Chicago. Our panelists today include uh, Dr. Ignacio Dallo, orthopedic surgeon at Sanitario Garay in Argentina, and unfortunately a victim of the COVID um, pandemic as he was supposed to be starting his research fellowship at OS, OASI uh, Bio Research Foundation in Milan. Um, he will be speaking about hyaluronic acid and bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Dr. Radek Grabowski is a consultant at the Sporto Clinic and football team physician for the Wood Laut um, from uh, Poland. Um, today he'll be talking about joint distraction. And our final speaker is Seth Sherman, Associate Professor and Fellowship Director at Stanford University in Palo Alto. Um, Seth is also our chairman of our Next Gen Committee, and he has a few announcements to make after his talk on agility. So without further ado, I introduce uh, Dr. Ignacio Dallo. Okay. Thank you very much, Cassandra, for your kind presentation. It is a great honor for me to be part of this committee, Next Gen ICRS, and participating in this webinar. This is my disclosure. I have nothing to disclose for this talk. Ignacio, we can't see your screen, if you don't mind sharing. Sorry. That's perfect. You now can, can see? see now. OK. Yep. Thank you, Cassandra, for your kind invitation. It's an honor for me to be participating in this webinar. When we face a biological problem, we have to try to find a biological solution with a less invasive procedure, reducing morbidity, accelerating treatment, and enhanced recovery. We have different uh, treatment options for different kinds of articular cartilage lesions currently available, such microfracture, mosaicoplasty, autologous chondrocyte implantation, and MSCs implantation. Our target is to restore the normal osteochondral unit function, anatomy, and the normal hyaline cartilage. Using this tissue triad regeneration composed of cells, growth factors, and scaffolds. We have different types of scaffolds available, such protein-based polymers, collagen, for example. We have carbohydrate polymers, such hyaluronan, artificial, and a combination of different polymers. But the ideal scaffold should, buy, should be biocompatible, biodegradable, permeable, reproducible, readily available, versatile for repair and resurfacing. There are some studies showing that the aluminum based scaffold enhance chondrocyte proliferation, induce chondroprotection, and chondrogenesis. Regarding bone marrow aspirate concentrate, everybody knows how to, to, to draw the bone marrow, but it's important to, to say that we have different types of cells from white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, hematopoietic and endothelial progenitor cells, and we have a very few amounts of mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, if, we, if we look at the revised concept from Arnold Kaplan, we know that in vivo, these cells has multipotent effects, but in vivo, these cells uh, have a medicinal effects such immunomodulation, paracrine and trophic effects, establishing a regenerative microenvironment. So these cells are not stromal cells in vivo. They are medicinal signaling cells producing bioactive factors. This is the illustrative HIV mag technique for a single stage cartilage repair, uh, as you can see in the image, with a HA scaffold with a bone marrow to treat cartilage defects. Basically, we take 60 cc of bone marrow from the iliac crest. It is important to activate with batroxobin to get a sticky clot, and <clears throat> then with mini artrotomy or arthroscopy, after prepare the defect, the bone marrow clot is inserted and covered with the HIV mag with, with um, hyaluronic acid. This is a video showing how sticky is the BMAC after activation with Valtroxobin. 
In this short video, you can see an arthroscopy view of the preparation of the cartilage lesion in medial femoral condyle. This is the size match scaffold with the lesion. The scaffold embedded with bone marrow aspirate, readily to, to, to put in the, in the defect. And this is the, the bone marrow clot covering perfectly the defect, sealed with a tissue color of fibrin glue to, to stabilize the, the scaffold. So the initial idea was to compare a one-step technique with a two-step technique with biopsy cultivation and implantation that may see. This study was published in 2015 in the ICRS College Journal, comparing a group of patients with patellofemoral chondral lesion, prospectively follow up, one group of patients with Macy and other group with BMAC, using x-rays, MRI, clinical evaluation with different scores, in some cases, second look, arthroscopy and biopsies. There was no statistical significant difference in Coos, IKDC, Tegner, a three years follow up between Macy and, Ace and, and HIV MAC. And also, the authors found that no correlation between the number of coronary forming units and the clinical results. And maybe we can explain this with a new theory of Arnold Kaplan that uh, is not uh, the cell that produces uh, the, the effect, but also the, the effect is produced by the growth factors. You can see a video in your left showing a trochlear defect, treated 29 month follow up with Macy showing a good tissue quality with good integration. And in your right, a patellar after HIV MAC at one year follow up showing good results. This is the Macy biopsy at 29 months showing an ICRS repair score of eight in the Macy group. And in the HIV MAC, a good tissue quality restoring the osteochondral unit with mixed tissue highly light, but also fibro tissue with an ICRS assessment score of 11. The advantages of the HAV MAC technique is that it is a one-step surgery with a moldable and very adherent uh, scaffold to, uh, for cartilage defects with reduced time uh, and cost. As you can see in this slide, the total cost of the AC Macy is five times more expensive than the HAV MAC. This is a study published in 2014 in the American Journal of Sport Medicine showing 25 patients with large and multiple lesions treated with this technique, where the results significant improvement in IKDC subjective and, and, and all CUS subsets with final Tegner comparable to the pre-injury Tegner and the BAS score significantly improved at the final follow-up. This is a case example of a, of a male 56 years old with a full thickness in the medial femoral condyle, treated through arthroscopy with the HIV MAC technique. This is the size of the, of, the, of the lesion and through a cannula with dry arthroscopy introducing the scaffold, the HIV MAC scaffold to cover and fill the defect. You can use a couple of layers until the defect is complete. Embedded with BMAC, very dry, and then seal it with um, fibrin glue or tissue cold. It's important in the, in the, in the final of the procedure to, to smoothly uh, extend and flex the knee to, to ensure the stabilization of the graft. This is a one year post-op MRI showing a good uh, integration of the, of the graft. And this is the second look arthroscopy showing an acceptable tissue repair. The rehabilitation protocol is very important. We can discuss further, but we divide uh, in four phases. In the, in the first phase, the proliferative protective phase, uh, we do not allow weight bearing, but it's important to reduce effusion, inflammation, and pain. In the second or transition phase, we allow pool-based exercises with partial or total weight bearing, depending on the location of the lesion. In the third maturation phase, we allow a straight running. And in the fourth functional recovery, we prepare the patient to return to sports. This is the study showing long-term follow-ups at 10 years in this uh, patient, maintaining the clinical scores from three years to 10 years, showing good results. In cases 
where the college injury is associated with subchondral bone deficiency, we can use a biologic in Lego subchondral reconstruction using morselized bone marrow grafting, as you can see in the video, to fill the defect and then cover with the HIV MAC, restoring the anatomy of the, of the lesion. Here is uh, the, the image in the arthroscopic view showing the morselized bone covering the defects in the bed of the, of, of the bony component covered with the membrane. Now there is a clinical trial, a prospective randomized multicenter study in 40 sites between US and European Union with 200 patients comparing HIV MAC and microfracture. And to remember the name PASTA, because patient selection is important, do not indicate this surgery in smokers or obese patients. This is a nice uh, slide of Jorge Chala that address comorbidity before treat deletion. The preparation of the defect is very important. Remove the damaged cartilage uh, with vertical walls, uh, remove the calcified layer, but do not violate the underlying bone. This is a video showing a chondrectum, a special instrument developed by Dr. Sadlik and Gobi to prepare the lesion through arthroscopy or through arthrotomy. This is a chondrectomy histology showing a good tissue. Um, a good defect prepared. Do not forget to treat the knee as an organ. Arthroscopy when it is possible. And to finalize, I would like to share with you this case example of a pro ice hockey player with bilateral surgical surgery. Uh, as you can see in the image and the sagittal view of the MRI, a grade four condyle lesion involving the articular surface of the mayor femoral condyle. And in the right, an axial view of the uh, grade four condyle lesion involving the articular surface of the trophia. These are the intraoperative images with the brimen of the, and preparation of the lesion with the HIV MAC technique, completely covering the lesion. This is a, an axial view of the of the trochlea showing an MRI at one year post-op with good homogeneous integration of the graph with, with ISO intense signal. This is the patient at five years playing at high level sports with an MRI showing good tissue integration. These are the scores at five years with no pain and significant improvement in bus, in bus and Tegner and IKDC. But the patient at six years had pain in the opposite knee with the same lesion in the other knee. So the patient decided to do microfracture in another country, but after rehabilitation, um, the patient continues to pain to come back to Italy and um, the same surgery with arthroscopy and then mini open. The, these are the intraoperative images showing the HIV MAC technique. This is the patient at 10 years with good flexion and extension and active flexion maintaining the scores at 10 years in BAS, Tegner, and IQDC. This is the patient playing different type of activities, is very active and very happy now at 10 years follow-up. To finalize, I, I would like to, to conclude with this editorial commentary. Achieving good long-term outcomes while treating chondral defects has always been a challenge. Several surgical techniques for regeneration of the articular cartilage has been proposed. Among them, osteochondral autograph, allograph, two-step procedures such as autologous chondral site implantation have good results, promoting formation of a new like cartilage tissue, whereas other techniques such as microfracture result in fibrous cartilage and less durable repair. So we believe that single-stage cell-based procedure are an attractive treatment option given the potential to restore the anatomy, be effective, accessible, and safe surgical solution for this biological um, difficult problem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ignacio. That was a very nice presentation. Would you mind explaining to the audience, you know, I think most people would know how to harvest BMAC, but how do you build the scaffold, the HA scaffold? Is that easy to do? Is that readily available in every country? Uh, what will you have to say about that? 
Yeah, I think this is a very good question. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, in this technique, um, we use batroxobin. It's an enzyme that uh, in every country, a cardio surgeon used to, to make a clot and, and to not bleed in during surgery. So this is an, an easy way to activate the bone marrow and, and form this sticky clot. Okay, and we have a good question here from Fabiano Kapsik that says, any experience with BMAC HA in keys in lesions? Oh, this is a good question because keys in lesion has always been a challenge because they are very, very difficult to treat. But this study showing a multiple lesion involving multiple compartment uh, show good results, but this is of course not the ideal scenario. But um, this study showed that keys in lesion could also be treated with this cover uh, technique. But of course, we have to address before the comorbidities, such varus, valgus, or malalignment. There's another question here from uh, the audience. Do you go for periosteal suturing over it? We saw some sutures when you did it open, but how about when you do it uh, arthroscopically, Ignacio? Yeah, arthroscopic, um, is, is more difficult to perform. Uh, not, uh, not every lesion uh, can be performed through arthroscopy. You have to, to be very skillful. <clears throat> but for a small lesion and, and in, in an easy situation, you can do it through arthroscopy. Regarding the suturing, at the beginning of the, of the technique, we use suturing like in AC, but now with fibrin cloth or with tissue cold, we, we are comfortable with a stable, uh, without suturing. That's nice, Ignacio. There's a question that I share with Seth here. Um, he says, what do you do? We usually, you know, when we have a chondral injury, we're probably going there in the first stage, the breathe the lesion and try to make sure that the patient, you know, will need something else. It will prove to us that they will need something else down the line but trying to start always in a minimally invasive uh, fashion, trying to do just a debridement. Is this a first thing that you do or you debride the lesion and then you come and do this procedure afterwards if they need it, or you do this from the get-go? No, I think the, the ideal indication for this technique is a grade four cartilage injury. So full thickness. If we have grade two, grade one, and First, I, I will indicate uh, a debridement or, or just a conservative treatment. Seth, what are your thoughts on using a technique, a restorative procedure um, as a first line treatment? And what would be the rationale for using, you know, for just doing a debridement of these injuries? I think I, I struggle with this because I always try, you know, a less is more strategy. Um, particularly if I'm going to, for larger defects or multifocal and using technologies such as Macy or osteochondral allografts. That said, I think we all have room and that's why we are all here, you know, to expand our arsenal and to consider for select defects or the right patients, these uh, one stage solutions with uh, appropriate evidence associated. So I'm uh, listening intently and I asked that question not just to ask it, but for myself too. So I don't think we have that, that perfect answer yeah, yet. Sir. Cassandra, what is your go-to when you see a case in lesion? It seems to be a repeated question here from the audience. Um, do you think that resurfacing procedures are equal in um, you know, outcomes when you use just a resurfacing procedure or you use an osteochondral autograph? I think anytime I see a kissing lesion, I, I get concerned about trying to do any regenerative type uh, therapies. If I do do a regenerative therapy, um, a lot of it my go-to tends to be a cell-based therapy, um, but I will typically do an unloading osteotomy to try to protect both of those kissing lesions. Um, depending on how the subchondral bone looks, um, probably on MRI, I will also consider um, osteochondral allograft at that point. That sounds good. I think we can start uh, loading up the second presentation, Radek Grabowski from Lodz Poland. Um, he's a football team doctor for the Witset Lodz uh, from Poland. So we're honored to have him today here in this webinar.
Radic. Okay, I, I'm trying Project. to start the screen. Is it working? It is. Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, and for somebody, very good morning. Uh, it's a big honor for me to be in the same uh, session during the webinar with Dr. Ignacy and Dr. Seth. And today, the topic of my presentation is going to be joint distraction. I got nothing to disclose. And uh, just a short introduction, joint destruction is a joint preserving procedure. I use external fixation. You can find Orthofix, Monotube, Elizarov tool, or some design tool. And the aim of the treatment is to improve the pain and functional ability. It is not so old method. It was invented and described uh, in late 70s by Jude, and some sources are telling that by Aldegri. Uh, here is the paper from Giannini in, from JBJS, and there is the model of the ankle distraction on the medial sides, monolateral. This is the one we use. And uh, Giannini described in the second stage of osteoarthritis that you can use arthrodiastasis together with arthroscopic debris mo uh, as a good uh, treatment, as an effective method. And other authors, such as Labovitz and Sarai, uh, conclude that uh, joint distraction can delay arthrodesis or ankle substitution procedures. Here is the per paper uh, of uh, Utrecht group, uh, Mariens and, and Professor Lafeber, uh, describing uh, some results after distraction. It is important that it's uh, quite a long follow-up for seven years and there is a great uh, decrease in pain and increase in function, clinical condition, mobility, but also uh, there is an improvement in joint space width and some chondral sclerosis. Uh, the paper of Di Domenico, uh, you can see the x-ray uh, and use of Ilizarov uh, technique. And Di Domenico told that uh, after the extraction, theoretically, the cartilage got the potential to repair itself by means of mechanical offloading and fluctuation of joint fluid. So the chondrocytes maybe are able to repair by cyclic changes in intraarticular fluid pressure. Next one from Labovitz, uh, describing arthrodiastasis uh, as a salvage procedure and most often can be taken like a last ditch effort prior to fusion uh, or ankle implant arthroplasty. And did, uh, Labovitz uh, published uh, the comparison of MRI uh, one year after ankle destruction and uh, one year of removal. It was a relatively young uh, man and here you can see uh, a big difference in joint space width as well as uh, in subchondral uh, changes. Uh, the review from Castanini, uh, I highlighted for you some benefits like uh, long-term benefits in 73% of patients, joint space width uh, increase, improvement, improves that in, uh, are getting better over the time. Uh, but also here we can say, see the papers from Guyen and Mariensen from 2015 and 14, that some, sometimes outcomes decrease over the time. But still, we have quite a big group of patients, like 60 and 144, and 50% uh, of them uh, can, can live, can walk uh, without arthrodesis or uh, ankle replacement. Before I start uh, my part uh, of joint distraction, I would like to highlight that it's good to uh, that I'm glad to have a big mentor, Professor Domzalski, who got uh, more than 12 years experience in the field of ankle distraction. And every day in our city, we support different football soccer clubs, uh, to put it mildly, very antagonistic football clubs. But in the field of orthopedics and cartilage restoration attitude, we got lots in common. So here, is, uh, here are some photos from our uh, operating room, as well as uh, outpatient clinic. And you can see the monolateral orthofix use. Uh, two pins we put to the tibia and two, put, two pins we put to the calcanel uh, bone under the guidance of CR. Here is the patient at the day of the re removal just before. Uh, he, here you can find the x-ray and how does it look like. Generally, we get the patient with severe osteoarthritis uh, 20 or 30 or mo even more years after the terrible injuries of the ankle. And here is the joint space uh, widening, first day post-op, six week post-op, and how does it look like one and a half months after egg removal. It is uh, relatively the same on the lateral view of one of our patients. And 
There is one point I would like to highlight that if you got uh, in the ankle, not only osteoarthritis, but also sometimes uh, anterior impeachment syndromes, you need to think uh, about this before. And before you put the distraction uh, to the joint, you should uh, you perform arthroscopy. This is the slide I like the most from the uh, base of Professor Domzalski and you got MRI uh, preoperatively. And there is something uh, very interesting happening half a year postoperatively you get not only joint space uh, widening, but also some changes in subchondral bone. And one year and a half, you get still widened uh, joint space width. What is proved in the literature? Sarai and Didomek Niko concluded that distraction can be considered as alternative in younger and active patient population. Uh, Labovitz reported short-term success uh, that was mild, but the longer the patient has to recover from the procedure, the better the outcomes are. Now I would like to move from ankle to the knee, and uh, it is really worth to mention uh, the Netherlands, the Utrecht uh, Medical Uni Med University of Utrecht group uh, of Professor Matzberg and Professor Lafeber. They designed the ArthroSafe tool, which is ready to use to the knee joint. They got also a strong impact uh, in the literature, and Van der Voude uh, published five-year-long follow-up after knee distraction, and they proved that it slowed down natural progression of new OA and prolonged clinical benefit. Here we can uh, have a photo of Professor Lafeber and again, really long, nine years, uh, nine years long follow-up uh, and around 50% were free of arthroplasty. And when we, uh, when we narrow our group to men only, we got 72% of patients without arthroplasty after nine years. So uh, what about the hip? Uh, before, when we started to think about the hip uh, distractions, we got uh, a lot of research, we got a lot of discussion with, uh, together with my professor Domzolski, and uh, we found some animal studies and Valbur proved changes in cartilage metabolism and uh, Vigant and Kajivara in uh, dogs and rabbits models uh, found that the combination of subchondral drilling together was, with distraction was better than drilling in, in the cartilage alone. Next, Ibrahim, Kandel, and Segev describe distraction in adolescents, in Pertes disease, uh, but they put uh, pretty long distraction for three or even five months. It would be really hard to apply this in adults' population. Another paper from Sink and Gomez, uh, we found that uh, improvement in Harry score you can get even after two weeks of distraction, and it can be safe and appropriate procedure. Hosni, uh, with quite a long follow-up, uh, more than uh, seven years, proved that this technique can be a valid treatment option. Uh, Kim uh, reported and published that uh, after hip arthrodiastasis can be, there can be improvement in range of motion and also the pain relief. And coming back to the adults, we found that uh, avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis of femoral head affects mainly young adults, so between 20 and 40. Uh, I found also a really interesting paper by Papa Christos, and uh, he described the combination of his technique, implantation of bone marrow, uh, concentrate, uh, aspirate, uh, Ignacio Dallo was talking about, uh, together with growth factors, bone graft substitute, plus distraction of the hip, and after four years, uh, he revealed a good articular surface and excellent quality of life. All we know that uh, at the in the end stage of osteoarthritis, the gold standard is joint replacement. But what about young and active patients? Uh, here are some examples of our patient and very, very important for me are the age of the patient. We got 39 years with a bone marrow edema in the femoral head, it was without any injury. Here we got another patient with uh, a lot of cysts in the femoral head, he was only 32. The next one, it was 25 year old man. And the, the next one, 23 years of. So this is why we started to think, to, 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 to try to analyze, and we conducted uh, our study. And our study was, uh, we used non-articulated orthofix. So we put this for four weeks, and we didn't put any additional treatment without, uh, it was without opening the, the hip joint. Here it's uh, preoperatively and postoperative hip joint distraction by means uh, of only monolateral uh, orthofix. And the group of our patients is not so big, it's on just now preliminary study, but uh, our ongoing study are the group of patients with average age uh, 37.5, 
mainly male and mean follow-up we got one year and uh, here there are there, there are really good clinical effects most of our patients were associated with steroid uh, intake mainly oral some heavy workers some martial arts such as judo or brazilian jiu-jitsu but and also a group of uh, divers and here are our pre preliminary results there is increase decrease in in, uh, in pain and improvement in all who scales as well as all womax uh, hhs and oxford scales this is the slide I would like to uh, share with you. It's one of our patients after eight months. And in the acetabulum, of course, we got some cyst, but the most important for me was the subchondral edema in the femoral head. And just after eight months, there was no subchondral edema. And what was also very interesting for me, it was the joint space uh, in with increase just after eight months. So, of course, there are some disadvantages of our study, of our procedure, and maybe some concerns for the patients who are thinking about this. Uh, skin infection, hip immobilization for four weeks, restricted range of motion after uh, removal of the tool. And the, it's really common after one month, maybe sometimes one month and a half. What about scores and what about the arthroplasty procedure in the future? Is it safe for the patient? About infection, we found only skin infection without special administration of antibiotics. At the, this is the photo at the day of the removal in the ankle. And what about uh, the knee range of motion? I'm not sure if the video is working. The left uh, knee, left leg is not involved and the right one is involved. It's full range of motion. So now what about the hip? Again, the full flexion of the uninvolved uh, hip and the uh, uh, two months postoperatively, how the patient can move the hip. It's not our aim in this study, in this procedure, to improve range of motion. It, our aim is to decrease the pain. About the scars, just two months uh, postoperatively, small scars, and uh, after six months, they look like this. We got uh, also a small experience in arthroplasty following hip distraction. There is a patient, uh, it was a lady who was really not into arthroplasty before, so she, she was included in our study, but uh, two, two, after two months of good, after of good clinical results, uh, there was a big deterioration and eight, maybe even nine months after, she was after arthroplasty, but now she is Today, she's more than one year after this procedure in, and, and there is nothing, nothing bad happening. And, but we, we cannot rely on our small experience. There is also, a, an, again, paper from Utrecht University and they evaluated uh, a knee, total knee arthroplasty after joint distraction. There was no higher infection risk. So how does it all work? Uh, it's not a novel method, but it's still poorly understood phenomenon. There are some hypotheses such as negative joint pressure, uh, unloading uh, of the joint, some alteration in the joint fluid pressure, and maybe anabolic, not maybe, anabolic over catabolic process in the joint. But I think the good, and for me, the best person to talk about this is Professor Mark Berger, it's a biologist from Utrecht University with a strong experience in biology. We do not stop uh, on the ankle and the hip. Uh, we also get some other ideas and we also applied uh, a couple of cases for uh, first MTP joint with good radiological and good clinical results here with improvement uh, of the range of the motion. We also work in the Calypso study uh, about the unloader uh, only for the medial part of the knee. It's not the same distractor but the idea of unloading is pretty the same this uh, small unloader called calypso stays under the skin uh, with the patient my take-home message for you uh, that i would like to highlight uh, our aim uh, that it's really important for us to decrease the pain and to postpone the final solution the final surgery and of course it's uh, the distraction is not for every case of osteoarthritis the second take-home message uh, I would like to share with you one of the patients who were administrated to our hospital for ankle fusion, but we decided to put the distraction for him. For him. It was November 2017, and after uh, almost one year and a half, he came back to our hospital for, for hip arthroplasty. Uh, what is important in this his history uh, that 
it was the same leg and after the distraction he was able to go through the whole rehabilitation protocol after hip arthroplasty we didn't advise him to do a uh, hip uh, hip distraction because he was uh, 55 years old here is the slide uh, i took from the presentation of dr gobi who was this uh, also my teacher for a couple of months during my fellowship in milan and he gave me the lesson uh, together with Winston Churchill that in the field of cartilage repair, it is often perhaps the end of the beginning. Thank you for your attention. Alrighty. Um, Radek, thank you for a great talk. Um, just one quick question before, uh, for the sake of time, we're probably going to head over to Seth's talk pretty soon. But uh, how long do you keep uh, the joint distracted and what is your weight bearing status? Uh, in our study yeah put it without weight bearing because in weight bearing you can means uh, mainly in all righty i think we're having some technical difficulties with your internet so um next we're going to start off with uh, we're going to go with seth sherman's uh talk on agility Can you hear and see me, Cassandra? Yes. Excellent. So um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions from mine and then uh, to get back uh, to Radic, uh, or he'll answer uh, questions uh, on the chat as we go. Uh, it's a privilege to be here uh, with friends and colleagues from around the world. Uh, uh, Cassandra and I have been up at uh, 4 a.m., but uh, you know, I think it's uh, totally worth it for this type of uh, communication and collaboration. It's not advancing. There we go. So what I'll be talking about is the agility scaffold, and I'm really not sure how many of you uh, have been introduced to this um, scaffold for knee chondral or osteochondral repair. But like many things, it's one of the great uh, mysteries that comes out of the uh, open ocean. Uh, my disclosures are readily available online. Uh, this has been in the news. Um, I was one of the um, you know, first investigators in the United States FDA IBE study to uh, perform uh, several of these, but there's quite a larger experience around the world in Europe and Israel uh, prior to uh, this final phase three study, uh, and I'll share all that data with you today. Uh, the reason I was intrigued by this uh, is because uh, there are limited options for off-the-shelf cartilage repair. So we're really focusing on the, the potential or possibility for these single-stage uh, procedures. And also um, because of other benefits such as relative low cost, ease of use, uh, and as I'll show you, a strong basic science and clinical track record. So why see coral? Uh, we know it's a biomaterial that's been extensively studied with over 50 years of in vitro animal and human research. Uh, basically what this is is aragonite, which as Ignacio talked about for an ideal scaffold, it is biocompatible and biodegradable. It's good for bone. You can see coral on the left, bone on the right, uh, and that makes uh, sense to us all. And frankly, what we've learned through basic science research is that there's sort of a magnet effect for stem cells um, uh, for uh, basically the formation uh, of bone here. So you can see that these cells adhere to the agility and actively uh, begin uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. But what about cartilage? Early studies looked at this, and while we know that coral's excellent for bone, it was not as good initially uh, for cartilage, particularly in this rabbit model. It actually made fibrocartilaginous repair, which is not our gold standard or our goal. However, what about changing or manipulating the scaffold to make it biphasic? So changing the porosity at the chondral surface or the chondral phase. And several studies have shown that this can actually enhance the MSC chondrogenicity and create hyaline cartilage, which is extremely exciting. So here's what the agility implant looks like. You can see that it's placed in essentially at the level of the subchondral bone. We can see that there's differential porosity, the natural porosity down below at the bone phase, and then the modified porosity up at the cartilage phase. And what we'll see uh, in different examples is how this will create uh, on one side and on the bottom here, bone, and on the other, on the top and through those microchannels, it'll start creating cartilage. 
preclinical models have also demonstrated this. So you see implantation on the left, uh, we see explantation and then uh, preparation for histology on the right. And that's uh, actually the remodeling and regeneration of the bone and regeneration of the overlying cartilage. Uh, in this GOAT model, we can see that cartilage actually flows from the implant periphery towards the center and is enhanced um, by cartilage formation from within the drill holes. So there's kind of two different ways that the cartilage surface uh, is formed. And we can see here uh, through those micro uh, channels, uh, cartilaginous tissue. We can see these young chondrocytes um, actively and intensely uh, proliferating, uh, which is ideal uh, what we would want at the top portion of the scaffold. Uh, histology also uh, matches, uh, so you can see uh, basically restoration of cartilage, bone, and the tide mark. Um, here's micro CT, again, control to the left, agility on the right, uh, and MRI showing very nicely reconstituting uh, that normal bone cartilage tide mark, which is quite intriguing from an off-the-shelf scaffold. Here we can see MRI. So on the left, you see that the scaffold is put in at the level of the subchondral bone. And as we go to six months and 12 months, we can see bony remodeling in the base. Um, and then we can also see cartilage regeneration, uh, not just on top of the defect, but actually, and I'll show you clinical pictures, uh, regeneration around these implants. So it's interesting. Uh, and actually the technique calls for not just uh, placing large implants that cover the whole defect, similar to a concept we might think about in osteochondral allograft, but actually smaller and quite nicely spaced uh, defects, sp uh, uh, excuse me, scaffolds spanning the defects. So like smaller uh, oats plugs conceptually, and the cartilage can regenerate not just over the top of those small plugs, but around them, which is quite fascinating. So transitioning to clinical studies, um, you know, we often enroll a very strict subset of patients. They're the ideal patient, but in reality, that's just not the patients that we see every day. And I think that the studies that I'm gonna show you here really are more real world or real life patients, um, the problems that I wrestle with all the time. So here's kind of the big study out of Europe and Israel, non-randomized, um, single arm, but multi-center and multinational, looking at primary outcome of KUS, uh, 137 patients with almost 90% follow-up, uh, only 13% failures in reoperation uh, for a challenging group because it's not just focal defects, but it's multifocal defects, and frankly, also early arthritis. You can see that there is a good amount of uh, uh, females versus males. 30% osteoarthritic patients, KL, Kelgren lawrence 2 and 3, which is very different than the exclusion criteria in a lot of other studies. Um, most or half have had previous knee surgery. These were procedures done on the condyles or the trochlea or in multiple locations. You can see the age is quite a range from the young to the middle aged. Uh, and primary endpoint, coos pain, uh, significant uh, improvements in the results. Also statistically significant and clinically relevant improvements in all other coos domains, including coos sport. Here's an 18 year old with this osteochondral defect of the central trochlea. There you can see the um, scaffold. Uh, this one was a large scaffold placed centrally uh, into that defect. And then you can follow basically the remodeling uh, and we can see uh, reconstitution of the bone and regeneration of the cartilage. And if you look at the bottom, the baseline scores of Coos pain and overall to 24 months, I mean, the majority of these scores get in the 90s to 100, um, which is uh, quite, uh, outstanding for a really challenging group. Here's another patient from that first study. They had an ACL, they had a partial meniscectomy, they have mild osteoarthritis, they had this single plug to the condyle, and you can see again those scores going up substantially at two years. This patient had a second look uh, demonstrating a very nice regeneration of uh, what looks to be highland or highland-like um, cartilage. Uh, that leads us to the pivotal study that we've uh, uh, been a part of uh, when I was at University of Missouri and now uh, is finished enrolling and uh, uh, waiting for uh, final results. But we'll kind of share with you uh, this study, which was randomized versus microfracture or debridement. And this is not your typical study. The age was up to 75. 
They allowed uh, osteoarthritis uh, in those mid-range kelgren lawrence grades, up to three defects, both chondral and osteochondral. You're allowed to have menisectomy with only uh, some rim remaining, probably less rim than we'd be comfortable with for Macy or for osteochondral allograft. Allowed osteotomies, although you can see the range of malalignment up to eight degrees, uh, which is a lot more than other studies. So tolerance of eight degrees of varus or valgus. Um, and, uh, you know, basically this was for the condyles or the trochlea. So we can see this treats uh, cartilage defects, osteochondral defects, and frankly, osteoarthritis. Um, we talked about how it's multi-center and multinational blinded. Um, uh, and uh, here's kind of what these groups look like. So it was mostly females again. Um, there were 50-50 had uh, early OA, uh, the KLs two and three. Uh, again, half of them had prior surgeries, as we would expect in this challenging group. And uh, up to a third of patients had uh, implants in multiple uh, locations. So not just on one femur defect, but femur, trochlear, or multiple femurs and trochlear or combinations. Uh, again, the age was a nice scatter from young to middle age. Uh, the treatable area really ranged from these small focal defects all the way up uh, to these large and multifocal uh, defects. Um, here you can see one of the patients in the study. Uh, so you can see this large defect of the medial femoral condyle. And this demonstrates the principle where we don't have to um, use one large scaffold. You actually do small skip scaffolds. And that makes it a lot easier. The machining of this is really like a simple oats uh, plug. Uh, you need to be meticulous in your preparation of the scaffold, and there's a great instrument set to get you where you need to go. But each plug really, once you get the hang of it, takes, um, I'd say, conservatively 15 minutes, but probably uh, less than that. And it's press fit to the level of the subchondral bone. And then what we can see is integration of both bone and cartilage and corresponding uh, improvements of subjective scores, uh, really up to that 100 for Coos pain quality of life and sport in this particular patient. Uh, here's another patient, two defects, BMI of 35, so bordering on not perfect. Uh, this is a middle age patient. This is essentially, you know, early osteoarthritis. We see the uh, trochlea and the medial femoral condyle. And so here is two uh, different scaffolds on either side of the center of the trochlea and one scaffold in that medial femoral condyle defect. Uh, you can see results on MRI remodeling up to 12 months. And again, look at those Coos scores from baseline to two years, um, including them really not participating in any way, shape, or form in any sport and uh, getting uh, to at least a moderate level of recreational sporting activity. So I hope I've showed you uh, the intrigue of this aragonite scaffold for osteochondral and chondral regeneration. Uh, there is a growing body of evidence. I think any of us who are in the cartilage space needs to really pay attention to what evidence is available for our treatment options. There are several treatments out there that have a great and or expanding uh, evidence base, and we should use those and not ones with uh, only limited uh, data as we go forward in our treatments for our patients. Uh, you can see here this has support of basic science, preclinical, early clinical, these are real world patients. These are the ones that when I make a problem list, relative malalignment, uh, five millimeters meniscus left, defect here, there, maybe everywhere, we now might have uh, these middle range solutions for patients uh, who are not perfect candidates uh, for um, uh, other procedures and not yet ready for arthroplasty. And so uh, those are the things that I think about and really the target group uh, where I see this having the biggest impact uh, going forward. And really that's the biggest target group that I see in my practice. So I'll ask us all, is this a game changer on the horizon? I think we need to stay tuned for the final FDA IDE uh, study uh, results. And also as a teaser, I believe today, if we're paying attention to the cartlet space, uh, there uh, will likely be uh, a fairly big announcement uh, from uh, the uh, Cartaheel and the Gillisy team. So you can stay tuned uh, for that on your social media uh, feeds. Um, and lastly, for a minute or two before we uh, end with questions, uh, I just want to uh, really thank and call attention uh, to our ICRS uh, Next Gen Committee. So I've been fortunate enough to chair this uh, committee um, for the organization. Uh, Jorge and Cassandra are our deputy uh, co-chairs, and you can see uh, other members and familiar faces uh, here in this webinar um, uh, who have really uh, contributed uh, to make this a very special group. 
Uh, our mission is really to identify and facilitate the next generation cartilage surgeons and scientific leaders. So that's all of you who are persist participating here on this Zoom. And what we wanna do is to achieve this goal by maintaining and building first a scholarly and social collaborative network to link the present generation of thought leaders with that next generation. So that is our purpose to get you guys to those who are leaders uh, in this field uh, so that we can move the science and technology forward. We have many focus areas, education and research, webinars like this, the national and international meetings and smaller uh, summit meetings, mentorship, really getting ways and finding ways to link you with interested parties or your heroes uh, in the joint preservation world. Um, we are very interested in surgeon and scientist collaboration. I'm not sure how many scientists are on this call, but that is a big push for us. We don't fully understand what the scientists do. They don't fully understand our clinical needs. If we work together, we can affect great change. Uh, and I think uh, social media engagement uh, is all the vogue and is a really great way for us to communicate and then networking and frankly, having a lot of fun. So here is the last meeting. You can see our happy hour. We had several of the world leaders and many of our young and next generation uh, sharing uh, time and sharing our common interest in joint preservation and cartilage restoration. So for those of you on this Zoom, uh, please join our Facebook group. This is our best and easiest way to communicate with you at different meetings. If we have these events, uh, we will let you know about it here. We'll engage with you. I think we can post um, uh, you know, in de-identified ways questions about uh, different or complex cases, and we can uh, all kind of join in this adventure uh, together. So I really thank you very much uh, for your attention here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, maybe all the panelists can put their cameras on and we can have a unified kind of group here for the last couple of minutes, and I'll let uh, Jorge and Cassandra take it away. Thank you very much, Seth, and uh, I echo your thoughts and, you know, ask for people to join us with questions or, you know, interesting thoughts on new technologies from around the world. It's always, you know, important for us to know what's going on so we can advance the the field together. I think in the interest of time, we're getting to that hour. Um, I don't know if any of the panelists or faculty have any other questions, but if not, I think, uh, Cassandra, I don't know if you want to give any final remarks. Uh, I think I want to thank all the speakers for their very interesting and thought-provoking uh, talks. I think it's exciting to see what we have um, kind of developing around the world. Um, they're certainly I mean, to use an American saying, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and we all deal with uh, cartilage defects, and it's just fascinating and, and really interesting to see what can be done, single stage, multi-stage, um, different scaffolds, and whatnot. And I'm sure we can go on and debate cell-based versus non-cell-based uh, for a long time to come. Uh, Seth, I just had one quick question. I was looking through um, kind of the questions. What kind of rehab protocol do you have for jealousy? Uh, is there any limitations? Yeah, I think uh, once you start doing these uh, techniques, um, you know, you get more comfortable clearly with uh, the stability of early range of motion. So there's really no restrictions on range of motion whatsoever. Um, you know, I think these, uh, to, for some of them, are early OA and, you know, we need to use remodeling. So there is, similar to Ignacio's protocol, some limitations in weight bearing, you know, depending on which part of the joint. Uh, just similar to MACE or even OCAs, um, you know, I think there's a difference between one focal defect and how slow or fast you might go versus multifocal or different parts of the joint or patella femoral, you know, trochlea versus condyle. But uh, I think uh, I've been impressed. Um, I try to slow them down. I mean, my limited experience, the ones I've enrolled in the study, you know, they feel something better and different and want to go faster than I want to allow them, you know, because I know the biology has to catch up with their subjective, uh, probably because of the relative limited invasiveness, uh, it, the ease of access. Uh, you don't need a big incision. So it's more uh, like, um, you know, Macy or a HAB MAC access than maybe a big osteochondral allograft. So they feel like they can go faster, but we slow them down. Um, protection the first six weeks and then, you know, functional progression over time. I think some of them could probably and do get back to sports, you know, uh, probably four to six months is too fast. I'd like six months or beyond, but I'm not sure that we need to uh, wait, you know, upwards of a year or two uh, with this technique. Any idea what the cost is, ballpark, or is this 
way too early to say. Yeah, I think it's too early uh, to know. Um, you know, I think uh, if we're talking about um, what the competitor cost might be or the, you know, the ones, uh, the products that are out there, um, you know, I think that it will certainly be uh, cost effective uh, compared uh, to those. So um, I think uh, it's not likely as cost effective as a standard microfracture, but that's why we're comparing it to that gold standard in the randomized study, you know, so that we can see for, you know, defects. Microfracture or debridement are less, um, you know, expensive than obviously any of the other technologies. But uh, I'm hopeful it's in the, um, you know, several hundred uh, to, you know, small thousands uh, when, it, when it rolls out. Thank you, Seth. Very exciting uh, technique. And also, I think it's going to be a great technology for countries that don't have osteoconodialographs available. And you know, all these alternatives that we have around the world will be the key for us to move forward. In the interest of time, I think we can wrap up this session. Thank you very much, the audience. Thank you very much, ICRS, for setting this up. Um, a special thanks to Anouk, who has been a, a great leader in, in setting the, the Zoom meeting. Ignacio, Radek, uh, Seth, and Cassandra, thank you very much.